Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Matthew Weaver. Uh, most people call me Weaver, and I'm a member of the Defense Digital Service. Um, I want to do this on the front end so I don't forget. Uh, I'd really like to call out uh, Kira Hutchinson, Allison Weiner, uh, Major Vanetta, uh, Colonel Robertson, and Dr. Mamie for both inviting me to be here today and making me feel so welcome. It is an honor and a privilege to be on a microphone at the Academy. I can't believe I'm here, so thank you so much for that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, how I end up here, what I do. Um, my most recent private sector career was at Google. Uh, I helped build an organization called Site Reliability Engineering there. The bulk of my responsibility for most of that job, I ran Google Search. So me and my team were responsible for the availability of the Google Search project uh, everywhere on the planet, right? So uh, we were sort of the last phone call that was known for us to call um, to make things OK. I resigned from that position in early 2014 uh, when my friend Mikey Dickerson asked me to come help with the rescue of healthcare.gov. Um, I'm going to stay here for a hot second because a question I've answered a lot in the past two days is like, what in the world am I doing um, as a federal employee, right, trying to um, help out here when uh, you know, I could be doing stuff like that? Um, what happened to me uh, as I helped with healthcare.gov, I, I basically uh, was a major part of the operations for the site the last two months of that first open enrollment period. So the rescue had gotten things mostly working, um, and I came in along with some other folks to help just like make sure that it stayed up and people could get health insurance. And two things happened to me during that period of time. One of them is that I came to learn firsthand how deeply troubled our information infrastructure is inside the government, I suspect most large organizations in the country, most of the big companies, and, and certainly inside the Department of Defense and in the services, right? Our information infrastructure is dysfunctional and crumbling. It's actually in a very, very bad state. Um, and no one else is coming to save us. Like one of the things I tell the people I work with a lot is mom's not coming home from the store. Like there's not a force waiting in the wings to come prop all this stuff back up for us and fix it. And that was a major awakening for me. Um, the, the second thing that happened to me there, we had a thing called a funnel. This is how you look at users coming into a web product, right? So on one side of the funnel, you have everybody that shows up at the home page. The next step is everybody who logs in, maybe everybody who gets a product in their you know, shopping basket, everyone who checks out, right? And on the far right, uh, for the funnel for healthcare.gov, it's the number of people that sign up for health insurance that day. So at the end of every day, I could see on this monitor how many families we had helped get through uh, the doors of a doctor's office, in some cases for the first time, right? And that basically changed my life. It made all the other accomplishments in my professional career crumble in my hands. Um, and so I stuck around. After healthcare.gov, I helped prop up something called the United States Digital Service. Uh, this is where the Defense Digital Service comes from. Um, we'll talk about it some more in a minute. During my time with uh, the USDS, I helped build a team at Veteran Affairs, um, and then I turned into kind of a freelance troubleshooter and helped both establish some digital service teams in different agencies and respond to various emergent crises in technology and the government. Um, I'll call out for this audience, given the domain we're talking about here. Uh, I spent a solid year at Google helping with some responses to some major security incidents you probably read about in the news around that time. Um, and I spent most of July last year at OPM, so I've been around those circles a little bit. Um, so USDS, I'm just going to touch on like, how they work and where they are, just so you all can know that. They're part of the Office of Management and Budget. They're brand new. This comes out of the healthcare.gov rescue and the efforts of folks working in the government for years before that to set the stage. The whole idea is we recruit and hire um, some of the best technical talent from the private sector to do a tour of duty in the federal government as a federal employee, like one or two years, typical lengths of service. Um, and USDS has set up these agency teams pretty small. The largest is 30-some. Most of them 10 more to the 10 or 20 people um, at several federal agencies at this point. Things are going pretty well. The Defense Digital Service is the digital service team at the Pentagon. Uh, it was established by Secretary Carter November 2015, like at 17 people so far, and we're just trying to repeat this play where we bring in some, some um, technical talent from the private sector and help fix, in most cases, existing software and technology, right? So we're not out there like trying fancy new stuff. We're just trying to get some of the things we already have to work better or get out the door at all. Um, some of the work so far has been things like service treatment record transmission to veteran affairs. 
Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this problem. There's a very lossy process by which your medical records get from the Department of Defense to the VA, help you get the right coverage and get approved for benefits. I've done some work there to solve a whole bunch of problems. Uh, one of the projects we're working on is getting the defense travel system replaced. That's pretty popular. Uh, usually when we talk about it. Yeah. Uh, so I don't work on that part, but a bunch of the team does. I think they did first traveler on the new system a couple months ago, so we should start to see a rollout for at least some parts of the Department of Defense here really soon this fall. Um, hack the Pentagon, they got a lot of press. One of the first bug bounties, I think the first bug bounty in the federal government. Uh, so that's super exciting and really cool. And uh, this uh, OCX and GPS3, that's a project I personally have helped with. Um, we're helping make sure the ground control software for the new version of GPS gets out the door finally. So b before I get any further, I gotta talk a little bit about one thing. Um, I don't know if anyone in this room has heard this, but when you say cyber um, in the planet I'm from, you're a punchline, right? This is actually not how I talked about this before I got here. Um, that's not how it works. So I'm going to say cyber today uh, so that we can all understand each other. When I say cyber, what I mean is stuff that involves computing machines, which, by the way, uh, now and certainly in 2050 is everything. You know, I'm at the point now where most of the stuff I put on my body every day has a computer in it. I'm holding you know, probably at least two things right now. My phones are my bag, so that's another two, right? Which brings me to one of the things that I think is really important when we think about cyber in 2050, which is computing is ubiquitous. Ubiquitous. We're already starting to go this way, right? So you have everything like your communications infrastructure, which, by the way, we call IT today. I'm going to come back around to this at the end. Um, the people who make the email work and make the networks work in these buildings, those are the cyber warriors, too. This is actually the bulk of the surface area that we have to care about this stuff on, is just our basic comms infrastructure. Um, and right now, we kind of don't. We treat it like that IT is over here and cyber is over here. And this is all, all those sorts of distinctions uh, are either <laughs> we're going to learn how to erase them to do better at it, or time will erase them for us, right? Certainly planes, you look at something like the Joint Strike Fighter, that's like awful lot of computers going on in there. Vehicles, I think we meant to build the MRAP around a laptop. I don't know whether we really got that done or not, but by 2050, this is like everything's actually going to be computers that move around. Weapons already, targeting systems are sophisticated, computers in all the weapons. Medicine, right? Anything else you can think of. Um, one of the things I like to call out right here when I think about all the places computers are going to show up in life, right now, mankind produces trillions of transistors a second. That's like the manufacturing rate, right? So every second we produce, I think, like seven or eight trillion transistors, right? And each of those transistors, we heard about this a little bit yesterday, costs less to produce than a grain of rice, right? So like the computer stuff, it's just going to saturate everything about daily life. The second idea I want to talk about is if we look forward to 2050, I think also about looking far back that same magnitude. And nothing about computing or cyber is particularly new. So I'm going to give us a little history lesson on the Department of Defense and the United States of America when it comes to cyber. So 1947, Department of Defense, this is military technology, we invent central processing units. So we did that, right? 1948, random access memory, same story, military technology, right? So we had the capability, right? This stuff was a part of what we did. 61, packet switch networks, those are pretty popular these days. Um, everybody in here is on one. 1964, invents pointers. I'm going to do a quick straw poll. Can everyone in here who knows what a pointer is? Please raise your hand. Yeah, it's pretty good. It feels good to be in the CS wing. It's awesome. I was talking to someone yesterday. I was really excited to hear that the program here just moved back to teaching operating systems in C. I was crazy happy to hear that. I think it's super important to understand those fundamentals. 1969, invents networking routers. Again, Department of Defense. 1973, invents internetworking. The idea that you could take two computer networks that were not the same sort of network and get them to transmit traffic between each other. 1980, invents the internetworking protocol version 1. 83, invents TCP IP v4. That's the one we use right now mostly. IPv6 is slowly eating the internet. Um, so that's kind of the history of cyber in the Department of Defense. You fast forward to 2016, and it's a little like DOD cyber, new phone, who dis? 
like we've lost the capability. We have no idea what we're doing. Um, we're fumbling around a lot. Uh, we're way behind in a lot of places, both here in the military, definitely across the government, and to some extent in the larger private sector organizations. So it, it wrinkled my heart putting together this history because I had forgotten how much of this stuff actually came out of the military in the first place. We had the capability and we lost it, right? Um, one more thing, computing already isn't magic. Cyber, we talk about it like it's this magical thing over there sometimes, and I think that's particularly dangerous. Um, in 2015, this will be even more true. It will look magic to us if we could look forward now, but it won't feel that way in the future. You know, like cyber isn't magic. It's not like the adversary is using a quantum cryptography robot to remotely suppress my autonomous weapons effector fields. Like, no. It's like, I can't tell which emails I get are real, and the pocket computer I carry everywhere doesn't work because we found problems with it three years ago that we can't deploy, right? I suspect a lot of this sort of the just mundane nature of what failure in cyber really looks like, that'll be the same in 2050. It'll be fancier stuff that's not working for dumb mundane reasons, but it, that stuff will remain the same. So it brings us to the big idea that I brought here today about 2050. I think about this stuff all the time. I, I think that where we have to get to as a military, as a government, and probably as a civilization, if we want to successfully deal with, you know, even the army cyber protecting and supporting the high atmosphere sulfate pump that we've stood up in the, the like wake of the Lake Chad disaster in 2045, that's still going to be pointers, internet working, and like vulnerabilities that need to be patched. Like All that stuff is going to look largely the same. I believe we have to get to the place where technical capability, cyber capability, is ubiquitous in the service at every layer of the organization. What does it look like if every single room, every single fire team, every unit of organization inside the military has at least one person on it who knows what a pointer is and knows how a network works? I think that's probably where we have to get to. This idea that we have some cyber we can call on or that there's some like cyber down the hall or in another building at the end of like, I am not sure that's going to make it in 2050. I don't think it's really making it today. We have to get to a place where the technical understanding is distributed all the way across the org at every level, right? So I have a little bit of good news. Um, this is what it looks like when your software can't give skin tone to a Unicode carrier. Uh, that's what those boxes are. The CS. EE, and even some of the IT programs, those are still pretty good in a few places. West Point is one of them, right? We're still in a place where the fundamentals of computing are being taught, not just uh, how to engineer software and manage IT systems, but the basics of how a computer works, how a CPU works, how RAM works, how a network works. Those things are still part of the core curriculum. I think one of the things we're going to need a lot more of um, in the whole period of time between now and 2050 is something that looks a lot more like an apprenticeship model. There is plenty about complicated, interdependent, intersectional computer systems, especially when we get to like the idea that you have widely networked swarms and all this kind of magical stuff that we'll probably see in 2050, autonomous firing units, all that jazz. There is a lot about building, fixing, deploying, and working with complicated technical systems like that that will never fit in a three-ring binder, will never fit in a textbook. We have to have a widespread apprenticeship model where we're bringing like, technical operational experience to the people who already have the fundamentals from a classroom. Um, we've heard a lot about retention the past couple of days. Uh, money always comes up. I actually think the thing that will keep the highly desirable technical talent around is empowerment. The money is going to matter a little bit. But what will matter more is that, like for me, Part of the reason I keep sticking around and helping with this digital service stuff in the government is that right now, my circumstances are I'm empowered to actually do something about the problem, kind of now. I'm empowered to get on a computer, change something about what that computer is doing, and immediately have an effect on what's happening. Not 
produce a plan for a layer of leadership that will interpret it and produce another plan and so on and so on and so on for something that might help 20 years from now when the program finally finishes and fixes all of our problems, right? So we have to find a way to push that empowerment down to the people with the technical capability all over the place. Let them off the leash a little bit. Let them do the job. And I'm going to call it out again here now, retention. Our IT staff, who we don't treat like cyber warriors, that is what the front line against all the advanced persistent threats actually look like. It is the email systems. It is the desktop updates. It's like having recent versions of Windows on the machines. That's, like, that's what this really looks like. Um, and I suspect, I said this earlier, will remain to look like that even in 2050. The desktops may be more like the robot that walks around with me and carries load and maybe has like a laser targeting system on its head or whatever, but like uh, dollars to donuts, the block and tackle maintenance of the software systems on those things will be the bulk of the real work on the defensive side of cyber. That's all I've got for us today. I know that partnerships have come up. Um, when I think about this apprenticeship model, right, and what that really needs to look like, I want it to be possible in 2050 for technically competent folks at any level of leadership in the military to be able to go to the private sector for a little while, a couple years at a time, and have their experience respected and recognized. And I want the same to be true for private sector employees in the military. Like, I want a fully functional revolving door for two-year terms of service from the folks at the keyboards all the way up to the boardroom. I think it's really important. I want that membrane to be very permeable. I think there's a lot the private sector can learn from the military and the government and vice versa. So with that, you've got me until lunch. I'm happy to uh, go off message on anything you ask me of. So you talk, you talk about the uh, having everybody, in, in every room, having at least one person who understands pointers and networks. Yeah. Now, fast forward to 2050, at least a chunk, we, we, we'll leave which fraction apart, at least a chunk of the software and the networks we use and rely upon will be developed in near real time by autonomous systems, autonomous agents. So how does that change the dynamic of the individual who needs to understand how that process is happening? Because it's no longer about pointers and networks so much as it is about that AI that is creating them for us. Yeah, my experience so far, and you know, we'll we'll see if this holds true, um, is that these basic fundamentals about how, like, even in the middle of that AI, maybe there's a million of them, but there's still CPUs. We're still like there's still a program counter. There's still the next instruction being run by a set of transistors. And my experience so far is that understanding those fundamentals about how a computer works and how a network works, there will still be message headers. There will still be link layers, right? There will still be the basic task of getting bits from one place to another place. That knowledge, at least for me, has scaled to systems made of millions of components. Like that's what allowed me to understand and operate something like Google Search, which is, you know, depend on how you count what the last public numbers look like, but their fleet's millions of machines. And so it's my belief that the complexity will continue to scale. You're absolutely right. And, and scale faster in a lot of dimensions. But the fundamentals, I believe, will serve to bring understanding and the ability to manage that complexity and do anything about it, right? I don't know what the skill set will actually look like to keep the AI in line, you know, or beat it up for it's like you're still doing stack smashing, you know, like, I don't know. But my guess is if you understand how a stack works, you understand how a CPU works, you'll be able to work it out, right? Like that, those, those layers of additional complicated skill specific knowledge will, will still be based on those fundamentals. So we'll see. I'd love to be around in 2050 to find out if I'm right, you know. Hey, Matthew, Brent Chapman, DIUX. So you hey. talked about your, your decision to move from Google uh, to DDS, which is clearly not a, not a trivial one. One I'd like you, could you talk about uh, the trends you've noticed among your peers as to why they're, they're also moving? And then two, can you speak about knowing how aggressively uh, the rest of industry is recruiting top talent, what do we need to do in government looking forward to 2050 to catch up with or exceed uh, those trends? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I, most, most of my peers um, in the digital service have come for reasons that look a lot like mine. There's two major drivers, I think. 
Um, I mean, the, the super short answer, and I'm stealing this line from Mikey Dickerson, is patriotism. Like, this stuff super matters to the whole country. Um, but, but if I decompose that a little bit, I, I think there's two sides to it. One of them is that the, the problem space is really interesting. The only place, there, there are not a lot of places I can go from Google to find another order of magnitude of complexity in the problem space. Government is one of them, right? The military is one of them. It's one of the only places I can go where things are then just another order of mag more complicated. Um, the other is impact. There is almost no place else I can go other than the military and the government where I can have a material impact on the quality of millions of lives. It is very hard to find a place to do that. So I think that those are the two things that, that most of the folks who have an experience and a background like mine have come for. Um, that's, that's probably the big piece of it. Um, so yeah, let's talk about how to compete, right? Um, I think it can't hurt to, you know, we heard a little bit the first day about messaging and perception of the military and all that. I don't come from a military family. I had a couple of cousins that served, but not my dad, you know, not, not anything like that. And for me, both getting inside of the government and then uh, having this opportunity to be so much closer to the military and be part of the Department of Defense, my understanding of how the military worked and what it actually did was, a, it could not have been further from the truth, right? Like learning a lot more about what's really going on in here. And, and so we, we heard a little bit about that the, the very first day from uh, one of the Frosts. And I think that's a part of it, right? Is, is helping get the message out there that, you know, what, <laughs> helping fix some of these systems in the military is actually going to enable like a huge amount of very positive things in the world, right? I think folks that don't spend any time close to the military, don't come from military families, it's almost impossible to know how things actually work here and what, what's, what's really going on. Um, the other thing that I'd love to see happen is uh, this, this idea that it's easier to move back and forth between military service government service and private sector service. And I don't mean, in this case, private sector stuff that's already close to those worlds. You know, that works pretty well already. You look at uh, some of the larger government contractors like Lockheed Martin, you know, there's like a lot of folks are coming and going from the military to work at Lockheed and vice versa, right? It's functioning pretty well. I'd love to see that lower impedance so it was true for the entire private sector. Like, I'd love to see as many people at Facebook, at Amazon, you know, at Google or whatever those com companies' equivalents are in 2050, right? Who have very recently been in the military, been in government service, and expect to go back there, right? Lower impedance transfer between those orgs, I think, is like the only way out of the box because it, it ameliorates some of the easier to see problems like the money, you know, the, the lifestyle, all of these things that, that fall out from that get a lot easier to talk about if it's like, no, no, it's cool. Like, come give a couple of years on either side. You know, I think uh, Secretary Carter is a really good model of this. You look at his career path. He's kind of been back and forth between academia and the public sector the whole time. You know? So I'd love to see more of that kind of thing around tech. So currently, a private can pull a trigger and kill someone on their own volition. But to shoot electrons, I need a three or four star. And in some cases, the president of the United States mm -hmm to have the authority to pull the trigger. Given how dense you're projecting the IT internet cyberspace in 2050 and how ubiquitous it is, what would you look at for policy to capture the authorities to pull the trigger in cyberspace and wondering and controlling where things might go versus where you want them to go? Yeah, uh, it's a super good question. Um, to me, I mean, obviously, this is the empowerment question, right? Um, I think one of the things that's going on is that, like, I don't know that we really understand what it means to pull the trigger in cyberspace, to, to borrow your phrasing, right? Like, I don't know that we know at any level kind of what that really means. What does that look like? And so it leads, I think, when I look at it through a policy lens or something, I'm going to be coming from a place of fear because I don't really know. We don't know what, like, 
We just don't know what this space looks like. And so some of the good news is, I think that'll sort itself out. Um, mother is, uh, the, the, the mother of all invention is necessity. As more and more of the sort of conflict space between the big nation states moves to this kind of like cybery, economic-y sort of stuff, we're gonna just figure it out because we have to. And as it gets more crisply defined, I think it will be easier for every layer of policy and command to understand what bits of this they can push down without having to kind of feel like they need sign off on every action, right? Um, at least I hope so. It's certainly a space where we're going to have to keep saying that out loud so we remember that that needs to keep happening. We need to be like very aggressively figuring out what's safe to push empowerment on lower and lower in the command chain because that's the only way we're going to let everybody off the leash to do their jobs, right? Hi. I uh, hey. really appreciated your remarks. Oh, thanks. In, uh, I'm going to date myself now, okay? But in 1978, I remember when our battalion headquarters got its first Wang word processor installed. It was a big deal. Yeah. And I remember very well in uh, 1987 when I was in graduate school taking a course called Microcomputer Applications to Higher Education. The reason I give you that background is because there was a time not that long ago where we hired people to be microcomputer operators. To, we, we hired people specifically to operate yep. desktop computers. Yep. Oh, what I heard you say, are you suggesting that by the time 2050 that many of these skills, these talents, these capabilities not only need to be ubiquitous but will be common skills? Let's hope so. Uh, I, I like so. Let me preface this by it's it's funny. I uh, when I look back at my own history, this thing happened to me in 1984, where they pulled me out of an elementary school classroom and put me into something called the microcomputers, uh, like advanced, talented, and gifted, whatever the heck it was, um, and stuck me in front of something I'm sure that was a lot like a Commodore 64 at the tender age of like seven. Um, so to hear microcomputers come back around on the guitar I got my attention. Um, let's hope so. I, I certainly intend to spend the rest of my career um, doing everything that I possibly can to distribute the experience and the skill set that I've collected so far in life. Um, I, like, I don't know what we'll do if these skills don't become ubiquitous because we know the technology is going to, right? Like that's just gonna happen. Unless you run out of oil or whatever, right? Or have like a major global conflict that might slow things up a little. But shy of that kind of thing, the computers are gonna be everywhere. Um, they kind of already are, right? Um, I do think that there is probably a lot of value in the middle term of returning to that, uh, returning a little bit back towards that trade model you know, I, like we were pretty close to it in the, the late 70s and early 80s, it sounds like, right? Like the idea that you had this big machine that was the computer and you would hire some people to like care and feed it and make sure that it worked all the time. That was just how it worked. It was kind of like having the heater, you know? Um, and something happened between then and now where it turned into this like idea. I think a lot of the time org organizations look at the computing problems they have as like someone else's problem. Like that's IT's problem, you know? When in fact, most of the organizations on the planet, the army now even being one of them, you are going software engineering concerns and you don't even realize it yet, right? Like your actual line of business is technology. Whether you're making pharmaceuticals or you're making war, what you're really doing is developing and administrating technology. So I'd love to see us move a little bit back towards that trade, right? And have a lot more jobs that are like, yo, they're like your job is to stay in this org, stay in this part of the org even, not this like, you don't live over in IT, you live right here where we're doing the real work and, and you're part of the, the folks who make sure all this stuff actually works for us, right? Can I, can I follow up now Please. with the same? So the first time I'd heard of the United States Digital Service, I gotta admit. So um, I, I was talking to a couple of colleagues yesterday and what I said was, it sounds as though what we need at the national security level for cyber is the equivalent of the Merchant Marine Service that we need a merchant marine service for cyber. Is that what the United States Digital Service aspires to be? 
Um, here, I will talk about the uh, aspirations are tricky. You know, my personal aspiration for the United States Digital Service is that we successfully establish a tradition of public service in the tech sector. We have it in law, right? One of the highest honors you can have I mean, is like to clerk for the Supreme Court, right? We have it in finance. If you want to sit on the board of a bank, you have done a tour with the SEC or Treasury or the IRS. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't have it in tech. This is just what a successful career looks like, even at Google or Facebook or any of these big tech titans, right? Um, that's my personal aspiration. Um, what I'll talk about what we have discovered works in the United States Digital Service because I think that's the important part. And whatever it, it aspires to be, it has to maintain these things or it will quit working, right? So one of them is we know that the digital service teams have to come from the absolute top of the command chain in the organization that they're in. So the Defense Digital Service is out of the Secretary's office, right? Um, all the other federal agencies where there are teams, those operate either out of the Cabinet Secretary's office or in some cases out of the deputy's office. We know that it, it's got to come from the very, very top if you want to get anything done. Um, we know that small, broadly capable teams are the secret sauce, right? So even those places where the, the digital service team is up to 20 or 30 people, those are actually a handful of like six to eight person teams who have a spectrum of technical capability that spans all the way from like user research through design, through front end engineering, through back end engineering, through like administration and operations, and even with the capability to understand and hack like bureaucratic policy, right? So it's these teams with a broad spectrum set that are very small, set loose from the very top of the command chain to solve end to end problems. Not just like make this one computer work, but make this whole thing work so that a vet gets their benefits. Those are the elements that have to stay true, right? Broadly capable, set loose from the top of the command chain, solving end-to-end -end problems. That stuff has to stay. If you lose any one of those three, and we've learned all this the hard way, you're immediately either part of the problem at worst, or, and at best, you're not helping solve anything. So I, and my experience is it, it works at any, I've, I've been at a bunch of these different agencies. It works at any organization of any size. That recipe actually works for fixing things, right? So. I can certainly be easily convinced that what we need at the national security level for cyber is something that looks just like that. Small team, broadly capable, set loose from the top of the command chain.